Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program, and this is a very special edition of The Journey Home. This program is the official 20th anniversary of The Journey Home program. 20 years ago, after Mother Angelica, um, uh, in her mercy and generosity, invited me to consider hosting this program. 20 years ago, on September 1997, we had the first journey home at the time. It was, that first guest was uh, Tom Howard. And, uh, and 20 years later, I don't know that Mother and Juggle expected that we would be doing this program 20 years, but the reality is the Holy Spirit continues to open the hearts and minds of men and women, laity and clergy, all around the world to the beauty of the Catholic Church. And I have to begin this 20th anniversary program by thanking you for your emails and for your prayers and your constant encouragement. And we're always glad to hear that the stories that are told on this program are an encouragement to you for your faith. And I hope that uh, those of you that aren't Catholic that watch this program, I hope that what comes across is charity and our love for you and our love for Jesus Christ and his church. That's what this program is all about. And we struggled with how do we celebrate the 20th anniversary. There's so much we could do. Uh, but I decided to invite three former guests to the program who I know you viewers like from past programs, but they're also good friends of mine. So I use this as an excuse to invite them to get together. Our problem is, and now we've extended this program. This is an, not a an usual hour long journey home. We've extended it to 90 minutes, just because I know we've got a lot to share as friends. So the three guests that we have for tonight are first of all, Mother Miriam of the Lamb of God. You might have known her as Rosalind Moss. Actually, Rosalind, you were on the first year of yes, the journey home. Yes. She she is, uh, well, we've got a website, motherofisraelshope.org, and she'll talk to you about, well, uh, her habit in a little while. To my far left is Father Dwight Longnecker, pastor of Our Lady of the Rosary Catholic Church. Uh, uh, Dwight, you were on one of the first years of the program. I, I know so. that, and you've yeah. been on a bunch of times pastor of a church now, and when you first were on the journey home, you didn't have that habit either. We'll talk about that. <laughs> and between them, I guess, Al, you could say it's like a ham sandwich, right? <laughs> Wouldn't have ham at this table. The bread and the ham. I mean, yeah. uh, I'm joking with you, Al, because Al is well known. Al Cresta, uh, AlviMariaRadio.net is a well beloved and listened to radio host, and we we all are here nodding our heads for how yeah. much we appreciate your work yeah. with Thank radio. So it's yeah. a wonderful privilege to have you three here. And I've got some questions I want to pose to you, and I'm going to try and stay out of the way as much as I can because of our limited time. But I also recognize that every time we do a journey home, there might be someone there that this is their first journey home. So you now all three of their episodes are on EWTN on the Coming Home Network website. But for a snippet of the story, how about if we begin with you, Mother Mary? Yes. Uh, Marcus, I am um, two years older as a Catholic than the Coming Home Network. It, 25 <laughs> years ago, 1995, that I came into the church. Never in a million years could I have imagined it. I grew up in a Jewish home, conservative Jewish, mother, father, everything. We were taught there's two people in the world, Jews and non-Jews, not a narrow upbringing at all. Um, and we waited for the Messiah all our young lives. Um, when I was 11, my brother David was bar mitzvahed. Uh, it was my turn in the midst of the Passover Seder with our extended family to go to the door to see if the Messiah had come. And Elijah would proceed and we weren't sure how far apart. And I remember my little legs shaking because when Messiah came, he would bring the Jewish people together from the four corners of the earth, put us back in Jerusalem where we belong. There would be peace on the earth. He would set up his kingdom. He would rule and reign. When Messiah came, life would make sense. And so every year we waited for him. And every year, even when I went to the door, my little 11 year old legs were shaking. I said, what am I gonna do with him if he's out there on the 12th floor of our apartment building in Brooklyn? <laughs> but that's where he was gonna come because we had a chair for him, a chair for Elijah. And so I would turn around to the table and um, say he hasn't come, they haven't come, and we'd leave that table saying next year in Jerusalem, 
because that's where we're going to be. When my, and he didn't come this year. He didn't come last year. But so he'll come next year. We'll be in Jerusalem. And I went to bed as that 11-year-old, and I said, is there really a Messiah to myself? Will he really come? And since I'm 10, I think I could say, I wondered why we're on the earth. Why is mankind on the earth? I had no idea, even if Messiah came. So what for? Past our teens, past everything, my brother David had become an atheist and was searching for truth. I, David, how are you going to find tr truth? A needle in a haystack. But he came across an article that said, we were in our early 30s, that there was such a thing as Jews on the face of the earth today who believed that Jesus Christ, a name we were never allowed to pronounce, <laughs> was in fact the Messiah, that he came to earth 2,000 years ago, and Jews believed this. And I thought, David, there's all kinds of people in the world with trouble. You can't be Jewish and believe in Jesus. <coughs> I met some of these, what I thought, very troubled Jews, and they led me over a year and a half to the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world in mind, going through the Old Testament system to the New Testament. Oh, it's, it's a story I'll never, ever forget. Because the main stumbling block is that a man can't be God. Will I ever stand before God? And he accused me of worshiping a man. A man can't be God. And one utterly miraculous night, I learned that I was right. A man can't be God, but that if God exists, he could become a man. He could do what he wants to do. I'm not going to tell him how to be God. <laughs> I became a Christian. I, my brother said, Roz, you're an evangelical. I said, what's that? He said, actually, you sound like a fundamentalist. I said, what's that? I didn't know. I was a Christian, a follower of Christ. I didn't know about denominations, Catholic, Protestant, never heard, nothing. So I became, and my first Bible study was taught by an ex-Catholic who was taught by an ex-priest <laughs> who taught me that the Catholic Church was indeed, I'm going to say this, uh, the whore of Babylon, yeah. Satan's system leading millions, of, works righteousness leading millions wow. astray. And so for the next 14 of my 18 evangelical Protestant years, I tried to save every Catholic. And then um, in one series of events that led me to the title of um, an advertisement that said Presbyterian minister becomes Catholic. Ah, Scott Hahn, I never heard of such a thing. I said he couldn't have been Christian become Catholic. This is impossible. <laughs> I listened to his tape and four hours actually. And at the end of that, uh, where all the Reformation issues, the sola scriptura, sola gratia, sola fide. At the end of that, Scott said this, and I'll never forget it. Um, for the, I still wasn't interested in becoming Catholic. I wanted to save my brother. He said, for the one who looks into the Catholic Church, 2,000 years of church history, and the church fathers, he said, to that one will come a holy shock and a glorious amazement to find out that the one, the church he had been fighting and trying to save people from was in fact the church Christ established 2,000 years ago. An electric shock went through me at that moment. And I knew that if I didn't look into the claims of the Catholic Church, I'd be turning from God. Last thing in the world I wanted to do. Five years later, I entered the church. Blessed be God forever. I found that it was the fulfillment of Christianity, but the most Jewish thing a Jew could do, to be Catholic. Sweet, Roz. Sweet. Mother Miriam. <laughs> <laughs> Roz, you will always be Roz. All right. Brother Al. Yeah. Uh, I was raised Catholic. Uh, we went to Mass weekly. Uh, we have, I was the oldest of five kids, and uh, we were sacramentalized. And I, I actually had a sense of the sacred as a little kid. I mean, I remember my first confession, and it was really, I, I remember to this day, there was an extraordinary joy that I felt. Um, some people thought, you know, maybe you got that release because it was finally over. Um, but no, it was more rapturous than just, you know, mm. obligatory. Um, and it, that always stayed with me. In fact, even more so than my first communion. So I wasn't hostile to my upbringing. But by, uh, you know, I was, by the time I got into uh, my teen years, uh, doubt began to set in. I had been president of my class, uh, athlete, <laughs> popular, uh, and all of a sudden I just felt like I needed to take, have a new identity. 
Uh, I was a guitarist as well. It was 1966, 67. And the calm years. Yes, yes. <laughs> My parents' generation had, uh, you know, extolled the virtues of wine, women, and song. Mm. And I thought, they're too tame. We should do it more intensely. Drugs, sex, and rock and roll. <laughs> and so uh, it was a very, you know, oh, no, I did not know anybody I considered spiritual at that time. I, I just, no, uh, I thought everybody was basically doing what they wanted to do. Right. So, uh, really, uh, those years led up to my senior year in high school, where I had a, a series of LSD trips mm -hmm. that were uh, pseudo. Let's use the phrase pseudo mystical. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I realized that even though I knew I was tripping, possibilities. I became aware of possibilities that I hadn't considered before, and that maybe there was some kind of consciousness, intelligence. Uh, and so within a matter of weeks, I had had a moral conversion. Mm -hmm. I had become aware that, <clears throat> look, if you're going to try to figure this thing out, you're going to have to have a clear mind. You're going to have to live a, a chaste life. I think my Catholic upbringing kind of kicked in a little bit there, at least at the moral level. And for the next five years, I did you know, basically, was, I lived on the street for the first year and then traveled around uh, trying to learn about what we would call new age thought today. Eventually what happens is I am to the point where I'm ready to leave new age thinking and uh, I have to come to grips with the fact that my New Age upbringing uh, was completely contrary to my Catholic upbringing. And the Jesus of the Bible was not the Jesus of this New Age movement that I was a part of. So one uh, Saturday, uh, I was at Michigan State University at the time, and that Saturday I went out calling in the name of Jesus uh, at that point he was, we considered him just one of many yeah. ascended masters. But I figured, how many of them do you need, you know? So you know, he, I did believe he rose from the dead, so that's good enough for me. So I'm saying, Jesus, I don't know what the problem is here. Uh, you can't, these are contradictory visions of you. And, uh, and yet, I don't, the Bible bored me. I didn't want to spend time with it. And, uh, on the way to, so I went down to the local occult bookstore, Mayflower Bookshop on Grand River in East Lansing, <laughs> <laughs> to try to find some sort of commentary, you know, that would help me put this, reconcile these conflicts. On the way there, uh, I was tapped on the shoulder by a Christian who was handing out tracts. And um, I went across the street, uh, sat down on a bus bench. And the headline on the tract was, do you want to know why some people don't understand the Bible? And it was immediately I had this, the, this interior jolt hmm. that made me feel as though I was exposed. I was, <laughs> I was at, this, at, mute, at this one, I was embraced and exposed at the same time. <laughs> And that's the day I usually look at, evangelicals would say uh, that was a born again experience because my allegiance shifted from the Jesus of New Age movement to the Jesus of the New Testament. Eighteen years I spent within evangelical Protestantism. I didn't return to the Catholic Church. Uh, and then eventually I was asked to pastor a church. I had a, really ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church was one of the things I was least interested in, but when you become a pastor, you have to start thinking about it. Over the next five years, the questions forced upon me as a pastor led me to reconsider what the Catholic Church taught about itself. Yeah. And I figured, you got only two ways to go. You go Catholic or you go completely independent. Yeah. And if you go independent, I saw what was going on in Pentecostal circles, that looked like lunacy. And I looked at what was going on in Catholic circles, and I said, it's kind of stayed. It's, it's not exciting, but the truth is, it's been around for 2,000 years. There's a stability there. So it's, again, gets, the story gets involved, but um, eventually I came into the Catholic Church, returned to the Catholic Church in 1992.
my family with me. Oh, that's the year we came into. Mm -hmm. you know, I remember asking that very same question when I was wondering, it's either going to be the Catholic or I'm going to start my own. Yeah, exactly. And even when I thought about, well, I could, even if I joined another denomination, eventually you either break away mm -hmm. or start your own if you don't agree with, I mean, that was it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as Newman says, once you become deep in history, mm, yeah. uh, you're on a trajectory towards the. Yeah, very much so. Father Dwight, I've known you for a long time too, and you've been a lot of different places in your journey. That's right. Uh, I was brought up in Pennsylvania in a very Bible-based, evangelical, fundamentalist family. Um, after high school, went to Bob Jones University, uh, which is not a Catholic school. <laughs> and our upbringing in For those that don't know, <laughs> one of the more fundamentalist schools in America. Yeah, that's right, and very anti-Catholic. Yeah. Uh, and. But while I was there, um, a little window of grace opened up. Uh, I met a, 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 an older woman who is a, a Catholic and a very uh, simple but uh, devout Catholic, a, a Benedictine oblate, a sort of mm -hmm. third order Benedictine. She befriended me uh, and uh, I saw in her an authentic um, Christianity that I hadn't seen anywhere else. L lots of good evangelical Christians, but she had something of a different quality. The other thing was that Bob Jones, um, we went to a little independent Anglican church with the delicious name, the Holy Trinity Anglican Orthodox Church. It was, <laughs> it was one of these Anglican breakaway churches. We went, well anyway, I caught the English bug uh, and uh, became an Anglican. I was baptized there uh, and uh, I'd been, I was an English major so I was reading lots of T.S. Eliot and C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien, all these writers. And I can remember one time as an undergraduate saying, um, all these great Christian writers, well, what denomination were they? They were this mm -hmm. thing called Anglican. Um, and so I went to the Anglican Church and that's where I felt the call to the ministry, um, mm -hmm. a very clear call to the priesthood. The door then opened up for me to go to Oxford and study theology, which was, um, well, for anybody who loves C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, it's kind of like our Mecca, you know. <laughs> so I studied theology there to prepare for the Anglican priesthood for three years. Uh, and then was ordained into the Church of England in England and wanted to be an English country parson, kind of like the poet George Herbert, mm. to live in a country <laughs> rectory and write poems. And, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> but the Lord actually allows our sometimes unrealistic or romantic dreams to, to be fulfilled. Yeah. And I did end up as a, as a country parson in the Church of England on the Isle of Wight pastor of two beautiful uh, thousand-year-old churches uh, and uh, by this time I was married with two young children and um, but the Church of England was going in one direction and over the last these ten or so years to this point uh, I was moving in a more and more Catholic direction uh, by the time of uh, the early 1990s my understanding of the Anglican faith was that I was, I, I would have said that I was a Catholic in the Anglican Church. Yeah. And um, my understanding of the sacraments and the priesthood was very Catholic. My spirituality was Benedictine and very Catholic. Um, one summer I had hitchhiked from England to Jerusalem and stayed in Benedictine monasteries all, all, all along the way. And what I was looking for was um, the historic church, the church which had its roots in history um, just like you, you've mentioned, to be deep in history and um, was to become, for me, to become Anglo-Catholic. And um, eventually, however, the Church of England was debating the, the question of women's ordination to the priesthood. And so I weighed up these two uh, opposing sides, for and against, and I have to say those who were in favor had good arguments, um, scriptural arguments and historical arguments and sociological arguments, and those who were opposed had good arguments, which then led me to ask, well, how do you make, how do Christians make up their mind when, when they disagree? Yeah. And that brought me to the authority claims of the Catholic mm -hmm. Church. People said, oh, you became a Catholic because you didn't like women priests. I said, no, no, no. But that was the catalyst which brought me to the point yeah. to say, how do we make these, yeah. these decisions? And it seemed that the Catholic Church ha had, a, had a referee in the game, um, and that referee was called the, the Pope. Yeah. and that finally there was a system and a way of examining the claims and, and examining these questions and then making, finally making the call. Yeah. Uh, and so that brought us to the threshold of the Catholic Church and then same year as you, Mother, in 1995, um, we left the Anglican ministry and um, came into the Catholic Church. 
not knowing what God would have for us next, but simply responding to um, not only the questions of the head, but also the questions of the heart. Um, I began, I can remember as an Anglican priest standing at, at my altar in my thousand year old church celebrating the Eucharist and not believing in what I was doing. And you, you yeah. can't continue like that. And so that brought us to the, to, 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 uh, into the yeah. church and it's a, a decision. The only thing I regret is um, uh, that we didn't do it sooner. <laughs> How late have I come to love? You know, as I listen to the three of you, again, and even reflecting on my own journey, it brings me back to the issue that it's grace. Yeah. It wasn't that the four of us were were the sharpest knives in the drawers. Um, and I'm not saying anything negative about you. I just know me. I'm not. I'm a butter knife at best. Uh, but but it, it really is grace. And, and often we can look to moments. We can look to tapes or books. We can look to people. But it still was a work of grace yeah. that awakened us. Uh, I remember being, for me, standing in a pulpit and, and looking out to my people, realizing that I believe that I'm Jesus and this is the sole foundation for our faith, the scriptures, and realizing, but how do I know that what I'm teaching is true? Because every other Bible-believing Christian that I know, we can't agree on everything. Right. Yeah. So the issue of authority or the other thing, I, I, the three of you, you came from a very non-liturgical backgrounds yeah. Yeah. into deeply liturgical, mm -hmm. yeah. all three of you. And maybe we'll talk some about that later, but I do want to address, because I know we've got a break coming up pretty soon, but I want to address, starting back with you, Mother Miriam, is that we don't call you Roz anymore. <laughs> because the issue was three clergymen. Mm -hmm. Now what are you going to do to be obedient to our Lord Jesus Christ and the call that he gave you and the gifts that he gave you and all? Now what do we do when we become Catholic? When, of course, Morgus, when I became Catholic, the last thing on my mind is what I would do. I was banned from my Protestant church. I was outcast. I was, I took a job handling an apartment complex, and I was a waitress, and, and what I was going to do. But I had an amazing longing. When I knew I had to look into the Catholic Church and never could imagine being one, I'm not doing this. <laughs> oh, no. And I went to dinner with my best friend and, uh, in the restaurant in California. And I said to her, Beth, um, I'm leaving, handling the women's ministries, everything of the, Catholic, of the Protestant Church I was with. I'm going to go to New York and I have to see if the Catholic Church is true. She was shocked out of her mind. And because I had been full time as a Protestant, she said to me, Roz, if you, be, if you become a Catholic, you're not going to be a nun, are you? <laughs> and I said to her, Beth, I never thought of that. I think she thought, well, you've always been in full time ministry. What, what, do, you, what do you do? What do women do? And I said, I never thought of that. I said, I was in a Sizzler restaurant, salad place. And I said to her, Beth, I hadn't thought of that, but could you see me walking through this restaurant in a black and white habit to the floor, I said to her. <laughs> I said, even if people think I'm a medieval wacko, they have to think of God. Whatever they think of God, they have to think of God. And you know you have, you have milestones and you look back. I let it go then, but it, it matched an incident when I was 20, Marcus, uh, Jewish in New York. Who's Jesus? Not Jews and non-Jews. But the news came out in the middle of the miniskirt era that nuns had permission to shorten their habits to any length. I didn't even know the word habit, <laughs> but I knew these women in black and white garb walked through Brooklyn, and I knew they were in the world for God. And the habits, I thought it was a religious accommodation to the miniskirt era, which it wasn't, but I didn't know. And it had nothing to do with me. And the physical shock that went through me the moment that I knew I had to look into the Catholic Church. The first time that happened is when I was 20 in Brooklyn and the news came out twice in my life, <laughs> 26 years apart. And I lo it was a, my a deep and immediate loss, that news. It had nothing to do with me. I lost what wasn't mine. So ever since I'm Catholic, I've never had it. I want to be a sign. Nine years with Carl Catholic Answers through airports. I said, what a waste. I'm walking through these airports every weekend of the year. What a waste. I could be assigned to God if I was in a habit. 
And I had calls from all over, people I didn't know. God told me he wants you to be a nun. What are you talking about? <laughs> Who are you? What are you? you? And the longing was so intense, and I dismissed it. I said, it's me. God, it's me. God knows me. He wouldn't want me. And this evolved. Uh, there's so many stories, but it evolved. And I told uh, now Cardinal Burke, Archbishop Burke, my dream one day. And he was Archbishop of St. Louis and invited me there to start this. Mm. And um, Daughters of Mary, Mother of Israel's Hope is also a story how that came about. The name of our apostolate is Handmaids to the Family. I'll mention this because I've always believed through my Jewish years, through Protestant mm -hmm. years, through evangelical, and certainly now as a Catholic, that the family is God's number one design to build his kingdom and therefore the enemy's number one target to destroy. And we want to help restore God's design for the family. So God is bringing this together, and I couldn't be more thrilled. Right. I'm, I can pinch myself every day. Hi, you nun. I'm so thrilled. I'm so thrilled. Do you look, look in the mirrors when you go by? I do. In windows, yeah. I do. I do. I'm in 4% Catholic Oklahoma, and they're so, it's just beautiful. Are you Jesus' mommy, they'll say. And I want to ask the, the, the audience to pray for you and, Thank you and the sisters. You're still trying to get situated. And, yes. Right? Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank All right. You. And then go to mothersofisraelshope.org and Mother, find out. Mother, singular. Mother. Yes. Mother of Israel's Hope .org. All right. Mother. Beautiful. Thanks, Mark. All right. Thank you. Al. Yeah. Let's talk about your, now after you entered the church, what did you do? Well, I had, I had the, the grace when I was, shortly after my conversion to Christ as an adult, uh, before I was Catholic, I had a strong sense of mission that I, it was a very broad sense, but it, I knew I was gonna spend my life disseminating the faith in some way. I mean, for 10 years, I, r I ran bookstores, Christian bookstores, yeah. and I thought, that's fine. That's in accord with what, it, eventually people asked me to do some speaking, so I did that, and they asked me to do some radio, I did that, and they did some, asked me to pastor a church, I did that. So for me, it was very consistent. Uh, I had been doing this, and I felt uh, that was, uh, I had that sense of call. And when I, uh, you know, returned to the Catholic Church, then the question was, well, what do you do? Well, I, I was already in radio, uh, and I could, the program that I was doing was more on culture issues than theological issues. So there wasn't any immediate conflict between working within the evangelical Protestant world with the program that I was doing. Now people, Detroit Free Press, learned that I had become Catholic. And they did a feature story, and that created a big <laughs> problem with many of my listeners. And thankfully, the station management gave me two full days to just take calls. You know, wow. three hours, six hours in total, where I could just take calls from people Fabulous. and explain why I became Catholic, or why I returned to the Catholic Church. And, uh, you know, after that was over, it was out, it was a commercial station, so it was a, it was a Christian station, but a commercial station, mm. and the program was financially doing well for them, so they didn't have any problem <laughs> with me remaining there as a Catholic. Uh, none of the hosts were supposed to make their ecclesiastical affiliation an issue. So, you know, that we just, I continued doing the program. People would call up, they'd want to know, um, what do you think about purgatory? I'd say, well, let me tell you what the Catholic <laughs> Church teaches about purgatory. And I'd handle it that way. And I would often, my producer, if they thought that people wanted to speak with me at greater length, uh, they'd get the phone number. I would collect those names, and off the air, I would put together what we called bridge groups, where I'd bring 15 Catholics and 15 non-Catholics together to talk about the things that divide us. Papacy, Purgatory, Mary, Saints, Eucharist. And I'd do a few talks myself. I use some of Scott's material. Yeah. Uh, and we saw, you know, over 100 people. Uh, come into the Catholic Church as a result of that. Hmm. Kid, that includes kids as well, families, you know. So I was, I felt as a Catholic, I was doing what I had originally been called to do as a Christian. In time, it, it just began to, as I deepened in my Catholic faith, uh, I, be, I began to see 
I could no longer avoid, even on the mm -hmm. cultural issues, a distinctly Catholic perspective. And so Sally and I were praying for about two years what to do. We decided to move to Ann Arbor, Michigan, because there was a great parish there, and we knew many of the people. We wanted to raise our kids there. And uh, after we decided to do that, I got a call from Tom Monahan, the founder of Domino's Pizza, and he said, uh, hey, can we talk? And I said, yeah, we spent a Saturday <laughs> together. Tom wanted to start a media apostolate and asked me if I would do it. And I said, wow. we've been praying for two years about it. Look We're going to move to Ann Arbor. We might as well work at Ann Arbor. How beautiful. So, that, so it worked. In my case, things came together beautifully like that. I know it doesn't happen to everybody that way, but that's my but, story. But I still, as I hear both of you, still the issue is, Lord, this is what I want to do. No, it's Lord, I want to do what you want. That's right. It, yeah, it. All, uh, that's it. and all here you are. The case. That's it. Before we hear yours, we're going to take a break following the, you know, the rules of media. We'll come back and then I'm going to ask you to talk to about your continuing journey of service yes. for our Lord Jesus Christ. See you in a bit. Welcome back to this special edition of the uh, Journey Home program. I do want to just mention that uh, 20th anniversary program, all the old Journey Home programs are available online if you go to chnetwork.org as well as ewtn.com. But it's, uh, you can access all the old Journey Home programs. And uh, if, you're, if you're linked to them through the chnetwork.org website, you actually can do a search for, give me all the, Meth the former Methodists or a, who are the folk that were drawn to the Catholic Church through the Eucharist? You can do all that searching yeah. at all the old Journey Home programs, including the programs that these three were on. So let's get back into the flow of things. I remember when you and I first met, you were no longer an Anglican priest. You had become a Catholic and you're working for the St. Barnabas Society in England. And what were you going to do? Right, we uh, left the Anglican ministry, and that, that had been my whole life. That's what we were, I hadn't trained for anything else. and, and uh, at the time, in the uh, early to mid-1990s, a lot of Anglican priests had, had come into the Catholic yeah. Church, and um, the majority of them had been ordained as Catholic priests, both married uh, and single. Uh, the married ones under the pastoral provision, which is a special provision for um, some Protestant pastors to be ordained as Catholic priests, even though they're married with children. So I applied as well. Uh, most of my friends had, had, had gone through the system, uh, but I got stuck. And uh, for various complicated reasons, uh, I, I was not selected immediately for the Catholic priesthood. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I, I think a lot of those who, especially uh, convert clergy, uh, face this huge problem. What are they going to do? How are they going to feed their family? How are they going to pay the bills? Um, I began working uh, part-time for a little Catholic apostolate, which was a bit like Coming Home Network, helping convert clergy. Um, but the Lord was doing something else. You see, he, I, I think through the graces of actually being taking that step in, into the Catholic Church, um, he, he unlocked in me some... Um, I believe some abilities that were lying hidden, and that is to be a writer. And I'd always wanted to write, but funnily enough, in my Anglican world, I didn't have much to write about. And I think it's because in that in that denomination, there's a lot of fuzziness theologically yeah. and a yeah. lot of um, murkiness. Uh, once I became a Catholic, it's amazing. Suddenly, I had stuff to write about. There was something I could get my teeth into. Interesting. Okay, yeah. and so I began to write um, because it's something I could do, uh, and it helped also to to pay the bills because um, I was getting paid for my articles and the books. N not a lot, and in case anybody's thinking <laughs> that they're going to be a <laughs> get rich writing for Catholic for the Catholic press, um, think again. But it was enough to help to to, to piece things together for our family and. Then uh, eventually I began to write a blog and things began to open up in a way that I, I didn't go looking for. A bit like you, it, one thing led yeah. open to, yep. to, to another with, your, yeah. with some skills and experience that you had. And then uh, after 10 years of waiting, um, 
And I can remember, remember some dark times when I, I felt the call to the priesthood. And I, yeah. I was in a, I one particular time in England in, in, in February. And if you've ever been in England in February, you know what <laughs> Lent is, is supposed, to, <laughs> supposed to be like because it's damp and raining sideways. And I was on my knees on a Saturday night in, in uh, some bleak church in a northern city in England um, saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? Yeah. And the voice inside said, just keep doing what you're doing which is not the answer I wanted. <laughs> and so I said, no, Lord, what do you really want me to do? Just keep doing what you're doing. That was to be a husband and a father and a writer and to wait on the Lord. Uh, and after 10 years, the door then opened up for me to come back to the United States to Greenville, South Carolina, <laughs> to the home of Bob Jones University, <laughs> <laughs> and to be ordained as a Catholic priest. So wow. if you think that the Lord doesn't have a sense of oh, humor, you, 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 can, you can pay attention to what he worked out in, in our life. And so the door opened to become, uh, uh, you know, to be ordained as a Catholic priest, and um, Marcus came to the ordination. Mm. It was a terrific That's right. event. That's right. and, um, and now to be a, a, a Catholic pastor, but also to continue my writing and, and working uh, for the Lord in that way. So I, I think also back to um, the difficulties that I had in making the step to come into the Catholic faith from my evangelical then Anglican background. Um, for me, the spirituality, the sacraments and so forth were, were things which I grew into gradually. They weren't so much an objection. The objection for me, uh, which others might also feel was, and this might this sound strange to Catholics, but I already felt I was Catholic. Uh, I, I felt in the Anglican Church, I had we had liturgy, we had mm. Catholic forms of spirituality, yeah. we had pilgrimages to Mary in shrines, we had Eucharistic adoration. We, we, we said, we, well, we're already Catholic because yeah. we did things in such a Catholic way. So the, the difficulty for me was to get over that hurdle of saying, um, no, you're not. Uh -huh. uh, you, you, you do things in a Catholic way, you appreciate Catholic traditions, <laughs> you do things that are so Catholic, but um, uh, there's still the question of Peter, there's the question of the Pope, there's question of submitting to, to the authority of the Catholic Church, which was a final step I had to take. And for me it meant giving up all those things that were very good in their way and very Catholic in their way, but they, they, they were not the full ticket. Uh, yeah. So I don't know what if, yeah. if there was a particular hurdle for you that. Oh, I, one of the one hurdle that I had was similar to yours was uh, I had so many Catholics telling me I was already doing a, a good work because I was a I was a mediating influence between um, even as an evangelical I was fairly pro-Catholic and uh, so I'd, I even had a Catholic priest. I, actually, it's a funny story here, now that I think about it. <laughs> I won't mention their names, uh, but uh, I had uh, two priests uh, came on the air within a few weeks of one another. One of them... So is, while you were still an evangelical? While I was still an evangelical, okay, right. and, and uh, one of them was known as a fairly theologically liberal fellow, a nice, wonderful guy, but a little softer than I would be theologically. So I told him what I was interested in doing, and uh, he said, you know, I don't know why you would bother to do that, because you're probably doing a much better work right here now. I mean, Catholics, you wouldn't do this, you couldn't be on the radio if you were a Catholic. And I thought, well, yeah, but I mean, that's God's problem, not mine. You know? <laughs> well, I had an arch conservative figure, well known, now deceased, who uh, was on the air with me. And um, when I told him that I was thinking of returning to the Catholic Church, he just dropped his head mm. and said, oh, oh. So I said, uh, where, where should I go? And he said, oh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know where I could send you. Then he said, how about the Melkites? <laughs> and I, I what, who are the Melkites? I mean, I had no idea. Finally, he said, he remembered. It like it, it might, might, might be a singing group, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. I don't do, I don't do four part harmonies. <laughs> he, he finally did say um, that he remembered Father John Harden, who mm -hmm. had written that marvelous catechism, Yes. for the Universal Catechism, uh, was in Detroit at the time. 
So I was able to go visit Father John and, and there's other good priests in the Detroit area. And I, I, I felt I was right. I definitely should become Catholic. But that was a barrier because it is related to other aspects of the social experience of being a Catholic. I honestly couldn't figure out why the Catholic parishes I visited were so lacking in enthusiasm. If I can just jump yeah. in here, I, I think you'd probably say as well how many people get to the threshold of the Catholic faith yes. and find Catholic priests and bishops who will almost say, don't bother, or yes. why would you want to do yeah. that? Right. And, and right. one and of the things it, which really is the draw in the end was, is, com, is the Eucharist, to say, well, I actually want to be in full communion with Christ yeah. Church. Yeah. You know, is, is, that, is was, that wrong? That was probably my biggest, Father, my biggest stumbling block was the Eucharist. I am so opposite. You felt you were Catholic already, and I thought, if the Catholic Church is true, what God have I known all my life? Hmm. Because it was utterly different. It was a way of seeing, not just doctrinal, right. a way of seeing. And I've never met, Al, such a creature as an evangelical that wasn't hostile to the Catholic faith. Yeah. I, don't, I don't even relate to that. Yeah, so it's interesting. It's yeah. amazing. It's just amazing. Yeah. Um, so people say, well, Mayor, was Mary your biggest stumbling block? And for me, no. I, I understood the church's teaching. I couldn't believe it. I put everything mm -hmm. that I thought made sense in Calvinistic minds. You don't don't trust if it makes sense, logic has fallen. But I would put it on the shelf and I wouldn't dare believe it until I could believe the whole thing. So I said, no, okay, I understand Mary. Mary put it on, I can't believe it. I put it on the shelf, but now I say, you know, as I've said many times, um, if you're looking into the church, go to Mary. She'd say, do I have a son for you? Every Jewish mother wants you should know her son. She'll lead you straight there. I was gonna ask you on that, the three of you, Let's say that we have somebody watching that doesn't know how to Mary fits into mm. this whole thing. Um, because of the 20 years on the program, probably the most common barrier for so many evangelicals is not just Mary, but devotion to Mary. Yeah. Yes. Because they also don't have a place for communion of saints and a lot of issues. Mm. Uh, how do we explain to those outside the church why? Mary is an important part well, of the of equation the, of our faith. One of the things came up, uh, one of the, the books I end, ended up writing was actually a dialogue book with a former friend of mine from Bob Jones. It's called Mary, a Catholic Evangelical Debate. Yes. And yeah. we um, actually got into a discussion and one of the really crunch points in the book was when I tried to explain uh, the Mary thing and I said to he was accusing Catholics of having hyper devotion to Mary. I said, look, what if we accused you of having a hyper devotion to the Bible? And he's saying, what do you mean? I said, well, you talk about the Bible, you have Bible churches, you have Bible studies, Bible, Bible, Bible. I said, why do you love the Bible so much? He says, because through the Bible we know Jesus. And I said, well, that's why we love Mary. <laughs> because the Ma Mary gave us Jesus. And it's through Mary that we know Jesus more intimately. And he began to get it then, that, that actually it's okay to have the Bible, to have Mary, to say because that leads us to Jesus and gives us Jesus. Yeah, it was Tom Howard, your first guest, who wrote that um, if Jesus came to us through Mary, how dare we, How are, who are we yeah. to stint in coming to him through her? Uh, he you came. couldn't have had Jesus without Mary, so why do you want to have Jesus without Mary? <laughs> <laughs> you know what Mother Angel uh, Teresa used to say, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, if, uh, to uh, K-N-O-W, no Jesus, K-N-O-W, no Mary. If there's no Jesus, what you just said, N-O, there's no Mary. If you know Jesus, you know Mary. <laughs> or you know Mary, you know Jesus, the other way around. She will lead you to her son. Yeah, and I was going to say, uh, throwing it back to you also, Al, that it was actually scripture that awakened me to the devotion I should have to Mary. Mm -hmm. Her, her fiat, but also all generations will call me blessed. Our Lord giving Mary to John. Yeah. I mean, all of that. Or Saint Elizabeth, who says, oh, "Who am I that the mother of my right. Lord should Look come to me?" She calls Mary the mother of God. Yeah. Yes. Right. In my case, uh, the biblical passages like that began this work on me, and I, I said, "You know, Catholics make too much of Mary." But, you know, we evangelicals don't make enough of her. <laughs> so it was a matter of balancing this now. And what, what finally, and it, it, Mary was my last significant doctrinal dogmatic issue I had to deal with, what finally brought it together was recognizing that all of the distinct Marian dogmas 
uh, are actually about Jesus. They, they're actually telling us who she is in relationship to the Son of God. And what he did for her. Yes, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the Immaculate Conception speaks to the, the, his divinity and how he needed to be received in a vessel uh, that was utterly without corruption. Um, the perpetual virginity is uh, a, a dogma which tells us that uh, uh, he is so unique in the human race uh, that to be followed by mm -hmm. n normal, I mean, look, I'm, I'm a firstborn, and firstborns are always accused of thinking they're God. But what happens <laughs> if the firstborn actually is God? Right? <laughs> <laughs> then, then you have a serious problem. So I, I, it would seem he's so distinct that I, I, the perpetual virginity of Mary preserves yeah. that distinctiveness of Jesus. Um, you, the bodily assumption, uh, again, uh, he raised his body. Uh, where did he get that body? Mm -hmm. He Flesh got that body that we receive from Mary. Mm -hmm. She donated. So how appropriate it would yeah. be that her body, that be her body too. would be raised mm -hmm. uh, as the first. The and center. you know, all the yep. reformers believed in the um, yes. perpetual yep. virginity yep. and immaculate yep. conception. I, I, I think also, without belaboring the point, one of the things in a very practical way is uh, non-Catholic Christians will go into a Catholic church, or maybe they'll visit a cathedral when they're in Europe, or they'll go in there, and they'll see the statues of Mary and the candles there, and people praying the rosaries, yeah. and they'll think, oh, these people are worshiping Mary. Yeah. It's an easy mistake to make, but if they go into any Catholic church anywhere in the world, for the main thing that happens in that church, it's the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And the Eucharist is the daily, weekly representation yeah. of our Lord's passion, death, and salvation. So anybody who goes into a Catholic church for what a Catholic church is really for, which is the Mass, which is the Eucharist, yeah. it's Christ-centered. It's, it's crucifix it's centered. Crucifix it's, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's And it's not about yeah. Mary. But, so this is a misunderstanding which is easy to understand, the people making, but go into a Catholic church for, for Mass and you'll see that it's well, not about Father, Mary. And Father, what you said is, yeah. is probably the, the key thing with evangelicals. It's not the re-sacrifice of Calvary, but the representation of the once for all sacrifice of Calvary. That is huge. Yeah. Right. That was Huge. a major realization too. Yeah. That was an objection that had been raised. Yes. Yeah. You mentioned Mary, and this year is a, um, a special year, mm. uh, the 100th anniversary of Fatima. I mean, we could talk about what you thought about apparitions before you were Catholic, but you could easily, with all the things that we celebrate happening uh, through the words of Our Lady to those three wonderful little children, you could summarize the five points of Fatima with prayer, repentance, uh, conversion, holiness, and suffering. Five very important parts of our walk with Jesus Christ. Prayer, repentance, conversion, holiness, and suffering. And you all know that amongst Christians, we don't all agree on the meaning or the practice or the necessity of prayer, of repentance, conversion, holiness, and then suffering. Talk about how becoming a Catholic has awakened you to a deeper understanding of one or all of those five aspects of our walk with Christ. Well, I'll, I'll just jump in. I think the second one on repentance is very important. You know, part of our evangelical background was tinged, if we were not Calvinists, it was tinged with Calvinism. Um, and one of those is the doctrine of total depravity. Now, I understand that the, the, the more sophisticated Calvinist does not hit anybody over the head with that doctrine. But as a child being brought up in that world, I felt hit over the head, mm. and I felt that total depravity meant I was a I was dirty, rotten scoundrel. Well, you were. <laughs> but totally. <laughs> and. The Catholic doctrine of original sin says that we are created in God's image, we're good, but it's deeply wounded by sin. And therefore repentance uh, is not so much only, oh, I'm a, I'm a dirty, rotten scum, I'm a miserable worm. It's actually the, a joyful thing of taking responsibility and saying, yeah, I, I'm involved here, I'm a sinner. Uh, and repentance is saying, I'm going to do something about it, I'm going to take responsibility. Therefore, repentance is a, is a very positive, very healthy, very mature thing mm -hmm. to do. And becoming a Catholic helped me to understand that aspect of repentance, which was not just, oh, I'm a miserable worm, but actually, I'm a sinner, 
but I'm going to face up to it and take responsibility and do something about that. And this is the other thing which Catholicism enabled me to do, was to say, your free will is important, and you can do something about this by God's grace and mm, with His in God's cooperation grace. You know, with His grace. I, I can't remember the name of the priest. I read an article recently that compared Fatima to the Reformation, and he points out that, in fact, Fatima happens on the 400th anniversary of the Reformation yeah, itself. And one of yeah. the unique things was that whereas the Protestant Reformation, very much of it was about the depravity of the will, nothing you can do, yeah. Fatima was all about yeah. what, what we mean? must do. God will give us blessing, but grace. we must be yeah. obedient. To, to engage yeah. with God's grace. Yeah. 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 And repentance is the, the key which unlocks that. Uh, I'm going to say yes, I'm going to step up and say I'm going to do something about this by God's grace. And, and when you go to confession, therefore, as a Catholic, and this might be another stumbling block, it is such a positive thing because you're saying, right, I'm going to get up, I'm going to go to, through the door, I'm going to get down on my knees, and I'm going to do something about this. Yeah, yeah. That's good. You know, when you go to the principal's office, I know none of you three ever did that, but I, <laughs> you don't know what's going to happen on the other side of that, but I'm going to face up to what I did wrong when I go. Right. The beauty of the confessional is you know when you leave, you're new. Mm -hmm. You know that's on the other side of the confessional. Right. It's wonderful. You know yes. that God's mercy is there. And yeah. I would, I would just, without hogging the time, I would just say it's repentance which unlocks those other four things that you yeah. want yes. to come yeah. to. Yeah. Good. Fatima, uh, on my journey to the church, uh, my brother David again, two, year, two and a half years before I was Catholic, showed me my first Catholic film, The Miracle of Fatima. And I watched this, the fifth point, Mark, is suffering is for me, is, is what has struck me hugely. Um, as Our Lady told Lucia, she appeared to those three children, she was going to take Jacinta and um, um, Francesco, Francesco, Francesco. Uh, home. And Lucia, the oldest, said, please, la dear lady, I'll suffer for them and be glad, but don't leave me here alone. Don't, don't take them. And Our Lady said, my immaculate heart will be your refuge mm -hmm. and the path that leads you to God. At that moment, still my evangelical, not trusting Catholic heart. I left the room. I went into the bathroom. I closed the door and locked myself in and I sobbed. Mm -hmm. I said, what are you talking? I've known Jesus for 16 years. I've gone to Jesus. If I could become Catholic, I have to go backwards and come through Mary now. <laughs> what my brother did was stop the film till I got back so I wouldn't miss anything of it. <laughs> the redemptive suffering. Who would have ever thought, now I'm not a masochist, I don't look for suffering. God has been gracious to give me lots of opportunities, but redemptive suffering to me is one of the most beautiful issues in the world. And that suffering comes that our suffering could be um, put to work, worth something for the salvation of souls, and it, it connects with the thing that brought me into the church. During the Mass, the priest would say to the congregation, parishioners, invite them to join their sufferings with the suffering of Christ mm -hmm. on the cross. I wasn't Catholic yet. And I said, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. You Catholics don't believe his sacrifice was sufficient. If I add to it, if I join, I'm adding. And if I'm adding, aren't I saying, thanks a lot, Lord Jesus, for dying for me? You didn't do enough. I have to finish the job. Forget that. And I thought back, uh, it's too much of a story, but I said to a priest once, do you add to the sacrifice of Christ? And he said, we do. And he said, yes, his sacrifice was sufficient. No, he doesn't need it. But yes, we add to it. And by God's funny grace, I thought of a mother in the kitchen baking a chocolate yeah. cake. And the mother has all the ingredients, flour, stuff, she's sufficient for the task, but her little three-year-old daughter comes in, Mommy, can I help you? What does love do? Love doesn't say, no, I got it together. I said, yes, love receives. The little one throws her an egg flour. Did the mother need it? No. Was the mother sufficient? Of course. Was it a true addition? It was. And I thought at that point, <coughs> I yelled, crucify him with that crowd. We all did. He died for our sins. And if I could love him back then at Calvary, as, as he's brought me to love him now. If I could go back 2,000 years and be at the foot of the cross, as he was giving his all for me, if I could crawl up on the cross with Calvary with him and give my all for him, 
I would want to do that, but I couldn't. I wasn't there, and I realized that that's the Mass. That one sacrifice brought through time down on the altar of every Catholic Church is Calvary made present, and I, who once yelled, crucify him, can join my sufferings. I can crawl up on the cross with Jesus made present and give myself through him, with him, and in him to the Father. And I thought, what manner of love is that? We could not have invented it. And every time now, whatever the suffering is, could be a cold, could be the death of, could be the who knows what, I have a gift to give Jesus. I have a gift. I said, Jesus, I'm, take this for the cross, for the salvation of someone I love, salvation of someone who hasn't heard the gospel, whatever it is, the healing of someone. It's the most, it's the greatest gift in the world. Uh, and we're familiar with a verse that maybe we ignored when we were Protestants, Gosh. when Paul says, I rejoice in my sufferings and complete what is lacking yeah. in the sufferings of Christ, yeah. what? For the sake of the church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very, very troubling verse uh, for non-Catholic uh, Christians to deal with. Suffering was the, uh, if, if the same topics uh, of five that you mentioned, uh, probably had a Catholic understanding of suffering really changed my, uh, changed my even approach to people. So mm -hmm. uh, when I returned to the Catholic Church, the primary reason was my distress over disunity. Mm -hmm. Because the, the broken, all the fracturing of Christianity discredits the gospel. Yeah. And Jesus gave the world the right to judge whether the Father sent the Son by the degree of observable love and unity that they witnessed on the part of his disciples. So I eventually concluded that you, uh, there's no way that the evangelical Protestantism is restoring unity. Uh, the leaders that I interviewed and spent time with, good guys, but they, they are doing their own thing. Mm -hmm. They had their own kingdom they were developing. So uh, I saw the Catholic Church as the, the only Christian community that took Jesus' words about unity with the utmost seriousness. And when I lost my leg, uh, necrotizing fasciitis, uh, flesh-eating bacteria got to me. Uh, I was given the grace at that time to say, well, this is one reason I became a Catholic, mm -hmm. so that experiences like this <coughs> could bind me to my brothers and sisters around the globe. Oh, what an incredible. And, and we suffer with one another on behalf of one another because of Jesus. And so Father John Ricardo was with me just before I went in to the uh, operating room. And uh, we talked about this very thing. Uh, that he, he said, you know, uh, I said, I, he said, well, what's your major concern here? I said, well, my major concern is that uh, that I suffer well. <laughs> I do this right. I was comfortable. I, 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 even if I was to die, I was aware that I had, had a, my life had purpose and meaning. And I, you know, my wife, uh, Sally, and I had a sense of mission from the time we fell in love. My kids were doing well. Uh, I didn't want to think too much about leaving them. but. Um, but I, I, I knew that you don't get many moments like this mm -hmm. where you're straddling life and death. And you want to do it well. You don't want to waste that suffering. Wow. And so yeah. Father John's exhortation, coupled with the grace, I don't normally think this way. So when, you know, I want out of pain. Uh, I learned that one in my teens, you know. I left Woodstock because I had a toothache, <laughs> and I was hoping to get some. I was the only, I was the only person at Woodstock that couldn't find painkillers, so I hitchhiked back to New Haven. <laughs> They've been used up by then. Yeah, so I hitchhiked back to New Haven. But, um, so I'm just saying, there was a special grace mm -hmm. given, and I don't know how to account for why those things happen when they happen. Yeah. Yeah. Like I was thinking when we look at the stories of of martyrs and we wonder could I ever yes. do that? But the celebration of a martyr is recognizing the grace that God gave that person yes. for their witness yes. that survives to this day. Right. Let's take a pause there. We, we follow the usual break and we'll be back just a moment.
Welcome back for this final segment of the special edition of The Journey Home, and our three guests are Mother Miriam of the Lamb of God, Al Cresta, and Father Dwight Longnecker. Uh, quickly, a couple other questions I want to make sure we get in. Number one, how is being a Catholic help us face this crazy world today? Yeah. In every, every, every way and every moment I breathe, our charism is hope. And I say, if I ever write a book, I'm going to give away the title, A Hanger for God. <laughs> That's what my body, has got nothing to do with me. It, to bring hope in the world, to say God still exists. Even if you're angry at God, you have to think about the fact you're angry at God. If you're an atheist, you have to think about the God who doesn't exist, who loves you anyway. I think, for, of Esther, the Old Testament, for such a time as this, that we have the truth. That's not arrogance. It's joy. Yeah. We have the truth, and God help us if we keep it to ourselves. Mm -hmm. The worse things get, all we have to do, I always say, how do you reach Jews? How do you reach Muslims? How do you reach anybody? Live as if it's true, and don't compromise. If all of us did that, I don't know that the world would be changed, but I feel the most privileged person to have clarity of truth and the freedom to compromise nothing. The minute you compromise, you lose your power. Yeah, I agree. I agree entirely. Uh, we are living in crazy times, no doubt about it. Uh, politically, America's in the strangest place it's ever been in my lifetime. There's nothing that approximates to this, again, in my lifetime. I don't know about the past beyond that, but. What we've started doing at Ave Maria Radio is, uh, in order to keep our, our focus, we use the phrase, build the church, bless the nation. And we, in that order. Yes. A lot of uh, evangelical friends and Catholic friends, too, were so interested in, quote, culture war issues that, you know, they, yeah. they I think, lost their joy. Because uh, mm -hmm. it, it, uh, they lose them. Yeah. So <laughs> we, we, that's, that's right, because yeah. yeah. you're losing. And so you've got to remember, what are we doing? We're not building America, per se. We're building the body of Christ. That's what we've been gifted to mm -hmm. do. So let's do that. We do that, that's not, that's not saying we're separating ourselves from our responsibilities as citizens. It's, it's not saying that uh, to, to be a good disciple, that means you can't be a lawyer or can't be a doctor. Be in no. the world and not of it. Yeah. yeah. And, and I was going to say the thing with that is, is that it isn't just America that's met. No, going no. We, we are, if you're building the church, you're in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in Poland or yeah. Africa. And, or, and, and yeah. we have a special relationship with Chaldean Catholics mm. in Iraq. A good friend of mine, a priest, is in Erbil, Iraq now for three years. And Detroit has a large Chaldean Catholic population. So right. we're following, again, build the church. And with Catholic, that clearly means universal. Yeah. And, so. and this is the thing for, for me, is also going back to history, not only the, the universal church um, all around the world, but also back through history and say, you know what? Yeah, we're, we're in bad times right now. Read some history. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, yeah. the, the church has gone through the, the you know the French Revolution and through the, through yes. the Marxist Communist Revolution. Uh, it's gone through times when popes were imprisoned. There's been gone through times when Rome was sacked and the pope was running for his life across yep. uh, across the, uh, the the bridge. Um, you know, with soldiers chasing. The one pope disguised himself as a woman. You can see him running away from. The, I mean, <laughs> the church has been in ter always been in terrible times, it, and it, still yep. uh, the rock is there, and we build. And I go back exactly. to Saint Benedict. I'm, I'm a Benedictine oblate, and <clears throat> St. Benedict went out at the end of the 400s, the beginning of the 500s, and he built the church. He built communities of love, communities of learning, communities of light, communities of liturgy, and from that, great things blossomed. So we, we don't despair. This helped me to see a sense of perspective right. and priorities um, to keep on doing the job, and if it gets worse, um, keep yeah. on doing the job, and if it gets doing better, it. keep on doing the job. Our, our parishes should be windows on the kingdom. Right. They should be the one place yeah. that people can look to to see something transcendent to yeah. their situation. They may not know what's going on, but they look at people who are loving one another, serving one another, praying for one another, bearing one another's burdens. Uh, it's a place where love is real. Uh, yeah. They don't know about the bread and wine stuff, you know? I don't know what they're doing in there with that stuff. But there's this respectful perplexity that the world should have as it, 
in Kansas City. The world is spinning around in this crazy world, and the parish should be this place in the middle of of, uh, stability and peace. You know, I'm thinking, you know, the, the year after John Paul was shot, and he was speaking, I think, at Fatima, it was saying how, first of all, he was the man in the in the mystery, mm. and he recognized that, the Pope in the mystery, but he also said that the message of Fatima back in 1917 applies as much, if not more, to today, yeah. yes. and yeah. it does to and today. Pope Benedict XVI said the same thing. Mm-hmm. It, yeah. the, the mission of Fatima is not finished, he said. Yeah, and the point is that yeah. God is, uh, disturbed by our sins. Yes. He's appalled by our sins. Yes. And so pray, repent, conversion, yes. holiness, suffering. If we can do that as a church, it will strengthen the church in the midst of this crazy world. Now, I want to make sure that we have some time to do something else. There have been voices in this crazy world that have been there to help the church mm. in its battle. And one of them is the reason we're celebrating a 20th yes. anniversary program, yeah. and that's Mother Angelica and yes. EWTN. Talk a bit about how her witness, as well as EWTN, was important to your journey back to the church. Well, in my case, uh, Tom Onahan uh, gave us the initial funding for Ave Maria Radio. And at that time, Mother had just issued a call for Catholics of uh, wealth to purchase stations or lease stations. or, And that's really the beginning of the Catholic radio boom. You know, 350 plus stations out there now. Uh, I We had the first. I mean, we were the first station to carry EWTN programming in Ann Arbor. And uh, then we began creating our own programming. You know, I did my program. And, <clears throat> and uh, you know, we continued to develop. But the, that, I don't think it would have happened without Mother Angelica's call. I think in, in Mr. Monahan's case and Tom's case, I think, her, basically she put a burr under his saddle. He was interested in media, but I think her call made it plausible uh, because he had such respect for her. I had the opportunity to interview her, didn't know her as well as you did because you worked so closely with her. But uh, I thought that uh, she she was so obviously called and gifted to do what she did that it was easy to just say, the Spirit of God's working here. I'm not worried. She's a model of heroism. She didn't care what anyone thought. She cared about the truth. She didn't care how people thought she should say it more nicely, you know. (laughs) Don't call people out. Don't call patients out. Don't call. She spoke the truth. And what what, um, attracts me is an uncompromising, heroic life. And that was mother. She told me she was Jewish. I met her. She said, I'm Jewish. I said, I thought you were Italian. She said, no, I'm Jewish. I receive Jewish blood every day. <laughs> <laughs> but a heroic, uncompromising woman. And if we ever want any seal of approval on mother, it's what God has done through her. Yeah. Yeah. Never in history. Does Unbelievable really the, what the he's done through her. Mary, the yeah. same thing. You the know, same thing. She, yeah. The Lord's asking her to do yeah. something crazy. And she yeah. said, <clears throat> and, and I think that's it. It's the example of faith. Um, she's a person who did what she could with what she had where she was, and that's what we're all called. She did to what do. she couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, exactly. Because she just simply, I mean, the picture of her sort of broadcasting from the garage or whatever it was when she started out. Yeah. And the Lord blesses, <laughs> always blesses that kind of obedience and faith. Yeah. It, 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 talk about Mother NEWTN again from the standpoint of when you were on your journey considering the Catholic Church and feeling like you had nobody to talk to about it. Did Mother Angelica and EWTN, whether for you personally or you've seen it in the lives of others, offer this respite of truthfulness to give them courage to move on? Well, I was in England at the time, so I was kind of cut off from okay. all that. But all right. I, I got a sort of second or third hand through uh, the tapes of Scott Hahn and, and some yeah. of the other th- ministries that were going on around that at the time. Yeah. And I tell you, uh, I didn't watch television. I didn't have cable. I knew nothing of Mother Angelica at EWTN. I hardly knew of you. It was Chris Franklin oh. uh, that, that uh, yeah. introduced me to you and Coming Home Network. And, and I've been forever, ever grateful. You, you actually, Coming Home Network, helped me enormously, um, but I have met countless people 
all over the country and the world. I just spent five months in Ireland and France, all over the world who have come into the church and back into the church because people say, you know, I, I wasn't Catholic, I didn't want to be, but this is crazy nun on TV that I just <laughs> kept, I just kept listening to her, you know, mm -hmm. it just all over the, the world. The first person I saw DW was that crazy gray cloaked monk, <laughs> 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 Father Grishel. Oh, yeah. I mean, right. I'm still yeah. a Presbyterian, the look at that guy. Yeah. And I wasn't, I, I said, he's a monk, you know. And he talked about Jesus, and that's what got my attention. Wait a second, yeah, Catholics yeah, don't talk about Jesus. Yeah. They're all about Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, in, in my case, um, it, it wasn't very direct. Um, because I was, I had become Catholic, I was still working within an evangelical context, but it was reassuring to know that Catholics were doing this. Yeah. And that, that it helps a lot because you realize now that it can be done. So it makes it a lot easier uh, to say, well, uh, whatever happens, uh, there is a place for Catholic ministry in media. So, yeah. I would say that's it's interesting. The four, plausibility. The four of us, our witness is that when we were all considering the Catholic Church about the same time, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And that was at the early period of Mother Angelica's yes. ministry. Yes, so it, exactly it, it right. would not make sense yet. <clears throat> right. But we were starting to hear, and here we are. 20 years later, 25 years yeah. later, and look at <laughs> it what her willingness to be of obedience has done. It's and, unbelievable. And you know, one of the aspects which is not brought up very much is the actual, the ecumenical movement. So often we think of the ecumenical movement of these theological discussions between high-level high theologians who are all being diplomatic and trying to be, you know, it's like detente. Remember detente between the Russians and the Americans? They all right. get together. But in fact, the, the real ecumenical movement, as far as I'm concerned, is an awful lot of people at grassroots through mm -hmm. EWTN, through yeah. uh, media ministries, through um, a personal example, who are actually coming into the Catholic Church and unity is being yeah. uh, achieved. Um, I know for my part, um, as an Anglican priest, I asked myself, what could I do to further church unity? Yeah. And the Holy Spirit said, you could become Catholic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that was one, yeah. one tangible thing that I could do. And so I did, and I would appeal to those who are listening and thinking about this to say, what can you do for church unity? <clears throat> you could become Catholic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the way to fly that flag. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you're interested in, in unity, uh, there really is no better way uh, to make that commitment bold and public than by becoming Catholic and letting everybody know why. Yeah, there's a saint of the church that wrote um, uh, years ago a letter about the Trinity, but in the midst of that he was talking about the image of a shepherd whose flock has become scattered. And how does he get the flock back? He keeps one of the leader sheep mm -hmm. nearby grazing it. Hmm. And with that leader sheep home, then the other flock will come back. Hmm. Which is why I think our Lord brings clergy, mm -hmm. opens the door of so many to come home, the courage to come home mm -hmm. as a witness. Boy, a fat guy loves the Catholic Church, well, yeah. maybe, maybe I can consider it. Hmm. Because we live in a very anti-Catholic culture. All you got to know is for in a Protestant family is for one of the people to start dating a Catholic and all of a sudden it's like, what? All right, well, I'd like you in the time we have to talk to people at home. Why should they consider making the same journey home mm -hmm. that you've made? I'll, I'll just say something <laughs> very plain and that is it's adventurous. Uh, you're going to find yourself uh, engaged in pursuits and activities that you hadn't considered before. You're also going to learn to love people that you would rather avoid. Because uh, the thing about being Catholic is that uh, there are, if you're an evangelical, you can hive off into smaller communities of like-minded people. You can't do that as a Catholic. You've got to deal with all kinds. And uh, you will learn how to love your enemies better. 
<laughs> I, I would say uh, a lot of our listeners be, be familiar with C.S. Lewis, as I was, one of our great heroes, one of the great uh, apologists for the faith. And his little book, Mere Christianity, gives a kind of uh, lowest common denominator for, for the Christian faith. And um, I, I steal ideas as, as a writer. I, I, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm unapologetic <laughs> about it. And so um, I've written a book called More Christianity, which actually is, is what I would like to share, is that Catholicism is not something different. Mm -hmm. It's something more. It's yes. the fullness of the faith. Um, and. Protestantism, I sometimes say, is like being in an art gallery where you've got one room full of maybe the p pictures you like, impressionist pictures, we'll say, um, and it's, it's good, what you've got is wonderful, but um, Catholicism is like opening the door to this huge gallery with many, many other um, rooms of artwork and many, many other things to explore. Um, and so uh, Catholicism is more Christianity, not less, uh, and that we would encourage those who are considering it to take that step and to, to enter this wonderful um, world of Catholicism. It's much wider on the inside, isn't it? Yeah. It's oh, that's much beautiful. more diverse yeah. and broader I on the Chesterton inside than not that, from then, the yeah. outside. And, exactly. and Father yeah. Rochelle said, for those who think that Catholics are the greatest doubly block to Catholicism, he said, come on in, it's awful. <laughs> <laughs> um, the truth will set us free, and I want to say that uh, one of our patrons is St. Francis de Sales, who says, whose main thought is be who you are and be that well, on a personal basis. I have never been so free to be who I am mm. since I'm a Catholic. I have never been in a uh, church that has such understanding of the human being, of our fallenness, of the dignity of life. And we have an atheist on my block, and he said, I don't, I don't believe in God. And I said, well, the God who, who, who doesn't exist loves you very much. And so what I <laughs> wish to say to you is that God loves you. If you're Muslim, um, the woman, the, the, the son who came from Our Lady of Fatima, Jesus Christ, is God. Um, and he died for your sins and he loves you. If you're Jewish, he's the Messiah. It's the most Jewish thing you could do. The whole question that separates all of history is, who do men say that I am? If he's the Messiah, it's a very Jewish thing to do. He's God. Um, the whole Old Testament points to him. If you're an evangelical as I was, I will be eternally grateful for all my evangelical years, for the love of Scripture, for all of that. And as St. Augustine has said, uh, similar to what you just said, Father, um, to be Catholic is not to have other than Christ, to be Catholic is not to have more than Christ, but to be Catholic, he said, is to have the whole Christ the fullness of Christianity, the fullness of life this side of heaven, all that God has given us, the communion of saints, the sacraments, and our Jewish mother, you should only know her. <laughs> he loves you. Uh, come home, journey home. And hey, what about our separated brethren that say, well, I've got Jesus, it doesn't matter what church you're But not the whole Jesus. Yeah, I think that's the way to look at it. The, 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 there's very, uh, the evangelical gospel is very truncated, it's, it's it, it's the emergency gospel, you know? <laughs> That's the way I look at it. It's the emergency gospel. It's, it's, it's what you do when somebody's on the street uh, ready to die. Uh, but if you plan to live for a while, you want to experience Jesus in a, as fully as possible. And I think you can only do that by acknowledging that his body is extended on the earth today. The church is, in a certain sense, an extension of the incarnation. Oh. And uh, I don't, and it has, again, oh, I, it I, I think most Protestants have a docetic view uh, of the church. They, they can't deal with the institutional, bodily, material, di empirical dimension of it. They want to keep it up here where we're all vis invisibly one. Right. The Catholic Church says that's not good enough. Jesus said it's not good enough. He no. took on flesh. Yes. So you could point to him, you could abuse him, you could make up stories about him. And the Catholic Church has that material quality to it. So the ch someone could say, where is the Church of Christ on earth today? Well, it might be here, it might be there, it might be here, might, but I can say it, it definitely is here. It's here. Uh, yeah. for, its, for all of its human failings and, 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 yes. and frailties, uh, there it is. And an evangelical um, would say, God is not a wafer in the Eucharist. He's not a wafer. And a Jew would say to me, he's not a man. I'd say, you're right. He's not a man. But he became a man. Right. And the one who became yes. a man became our food. Is it impossible for God? No. On, on this question right. of conversion, I sometimes use that parable of, of uh, 
the, the banquet and, and, and the servant who comes in and sits at the lowest seat. Uh, yeah, he's at the banquet and he is, at, he is down there, but maybe he's only getting crackers and water. And the Lord of the, of the feast says, hey, friend, come up higher. Uh, in other words, there's more to it than that. Yeah, and, nice. and come nice. come and sit next to me right here at the, at the table. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, I like that. I, I often think of that in the Vatican too. There was a, a moment when the, when the fathers of the council had to deal with this issue of the Catholic Church and the Church of our Lord established, and there was a debate there, right? Mm -hmm. In the end, they showed this word subsists. Right. And there are some that think they, they, <clears throat> they flinched, but I, I see that as an absolutely beautiful confirmation of the reality of Christ's church, because on the one hand, the Council and the Catholic Church affirms the work of the Holy Spirit and grace in the lives of our separated brothers. Sure, sure. Celebrates that. We yeah. celebrate together. Yeah. But yet that doesn't mean that it doesn't matter. No, the fullness That's right. continues, as the word subsists, yeah. remains, abides, same word, in this church. And so as John Paul said, the trajectory of all the beauty of the work of the grace and the Holy Spirit is towards unity yeah. in the one church. Yeah. What a blessing this has been to have you three. I want to make sure I have time for you to give us a blessing, mm. but we have a, a moment or two. Would you give the audience something to pray for? How can they pray for you? For us, for us yes, individually? for you. Um, I would ask that uh, for, for us, that you would pray that we would be 100% in God's will and that the women who come in would never, ever, ever disgrace this sign to God, that we would be holy. And uh, one thought, the um, message of Lucia, uh, Our Lady of Fatima told Lucia that the final battle in these days will be for the family. And that is the reason for our existence, for the restoration of the family. And your prayers toward that end would be a treasure. When you say your, your hour, you mean your order? I mean the order, daughters of Mary, mother yes. of Israel. So All right. Yes. Okay. Well, um, because our work is uh, focused on building the church, and then because by doing that we will bless the nation, I would just say pray for Catholics uh, who have not encountered Christ. I think this is vital. This is what we call the new evangelization. What's new about it? We are evangelizing the baptized. And I'd say this is a great uh, moment in history and it's an opportunity for the church to become experientially all that Christ has accomplished for it in the atonement and the resurrection in the giving of the spirit of Pentecost. But what, is, what I want is I want more and more Catholics who are Catholic in name only to understand the grace of their baptism by encountering Jesus. Yeah. That happened to me uh, when I was 23. And so I'm asking that, that would, you would pray that that same grace would be extended to millions of American Catholics. And I would I would say that uh, pray that people would help me to understand the priority of my priesthood and the priesthood that we share together, because that is the source of God's grace working through me for His Church. Adding to all that you've said, all right, thank you. and uh, I'd like to just say a prayer of blessing for us and for our viewers. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Loving Lord, pour down upon us Your promised blessing. Defend us from all harm. Help us to be followers of Jesus Christ, committed and intentional disciples. The Lord, may the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank the three of you. Hey, thank, thank you, you very much for joining us on thank this program. God bless the three of you. you and thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I pray that their stories and their witness are an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you next week.